it works, but yeah, my working. my phone has a better camera than that makes my sense. computer for some reason. Okay. Welcome everybody. I'm Matt uh, Rosenberg, Rabbi of Restoration in Seattle, and I asked uh, these three wonderful people to join me in a conversation um, about race, um, history, the gospel, um, what it means to be uh, black in the Messianic Jewish community, um, and um, what are the things as a community that we can do better, uh, that we can learn about, uh, well, first listen, I think learn through listening, maybe collectively lament together on the things we should have learned before, um, and then figure out how to actually love and embrace each other as images of God. Um, so I asked Shauna, um, who's the worship leader at Restoration in Seattle, uh, to join us. And David Randall is with Jews for Jesus in San Francisco. And Leah Charles is uh, a historian of sorts. She's going to get angry about everyone else all of a sudden talking about history. And uh, Leah was original. Leah is one of what my wife Laura and I call the faithful four of when we started a youth group at my dad's synagogue uh, when Leah was 13. And she was one of four kids who helped us get it started and now leads the same youth group. So that's kind of a cool um, thing. So I'll let you guys, why don't we just start with talking a little bit about yourselves. Um, and just give some context. Obviously all of you are black and I am not. <laughs> uh, I think some people will, will uh, not understand that I, I'm also not white, according to other people, uh, because I'm Jewish. So it's kind of a interesting, we technically have no white people in this conversation, but uh, why don't we start, uh, David, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your story and what, you know, where you come from? Sure. Uh, so yeah, my name's David. I'm, so my mom is Jewish. My dad is black. Um, grew up really in the church, more with not really much of a Jewish identity. I grew up always knowing I was Jewish, um, but didn't really do much with it because when my mom came into faith, her family didn't talk to her after that for a little while. So just had a little distance and she put a little more into her, her, her faith and her Jewishness. So grew up in the church. Uh, you know, it was really hard for me struggling with this identity of being black, being Jewish, and being a believer in Jesus, uh, being a believer in Yeshua. And so it really was hard for me to grasp onto my faith, right? The identity was really hard and the struggle was tough. And, you know, didn't really fit in with the church, so I always just kind of struggled. And then my first kind of experience with the Messianic community was when I was 25. Uh, and I fell in love with it. It's like literally instantly a Shabbat dinner, fell in love with the community, the people, and the acceptance. And from that day, just kind of stepped in and was a part of it. And my faith made a little bit more sense to me as well with that process. And prior to kind of through that, that kind of sparked my passion to share my Jewish knowledge with other Jewish people and my faith with other Jewish people. And that's kind mm -hmm. of what started me on to my path into ministry. Cool. And you, you work full time with J for J? Is that your yeah, uh, full time yeah. gig? Yeah. Full-time uh, San Francisco running the, the Bay Area, as of right now. You, you have family? What's I have a wife. Situation? Yeah, I got a wife and two kids, a son and a okay. daughter. Yeah. How old, how old are your kids? Four and five months. Ooh, just getting started. Yeah. One was born, you know, a month before <laughs> Corona. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Five months. That's funny. It was what perfect for my world. wife, because she went on, you know, maternity leave for a month, was went back right. to one day and then went home <laughs> nice right that's funny cool uh okay leah tell us your story yeah so i'm 
uh, been involved in the movement, like you said, for a long time. Uh, essentially, grew up Messianic. Um, I mean, we started off like I was baptized in the Catholic Church, and then um, my family's from Haiti, so Catholic. Um, and so we, but then we church hopped for a while um, growing up, and then we landed at Shuva when I was 10. So I was pretty young when we started at Shuva. Um, and then I, uh, I guess my first, well, I'll back up a little bit. I think like our congregation is pretty um, multi-ethnic, multicultural. Um, mm -hmm. It's in the congregants and, and definitely now in its leadership. Um, and so I didn't really feel that tension 100% in the congregation, but I do know our very first uh, Shabbat there at Shuva, my mom, when we got there, my mom was like, all right, let's sit in the back. If something weird goes down, we could just leave quick. Uh, and, and then our first thought was to actually look and see if there were any other black people there. Um, and there was like one other couple there. Um, and so, but the first sermon Rabbi David preached was, happened to be, we happened to go on Martin Luther King weekend. And so he talked about Martin Luther King and then we were like, okay, cool. Like they, they're willing to oh, like funny. talk about this or like, you know, from the pulpit kind of a thing. Um, and then super welcoming, warm, all that jazz. Um, hmm. and I didn't really experience like any sort of real tension with racism until I started going to Messiah Conference and just like the greater messianic world and, and realizing mm -hmm. that what was happening in my congregation was not typical um, and that other congregations were very, very different um, mm -hmm. and in the Jew Gentile divide and then certainly not being white. Um, so, so that was all very interesting sort of navigating that as a teenager. Um, and then of course I am involved in leadership with the YMJ um, and I'm, and I'm the person who pushes the envelope, <laughs> which is funny because in like my yes. secular job, that is not, I don't, push that's not your jam. No, but, but because I'm in yeah. because of religious worlds, it seems like I'm pushing the envelope. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. an interesting dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't, where did pushing the envelope come from? Why is that a thing? Why is Ooh, did somebody push? Yeah, did somebody push an envelope across the table and be like, "I'm making this an issue." Maybe. Like, Maybe. Go, 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 go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, let's come back. We'll come back to that. But David yeah. kept saying, "Well, you said black and Jewish a couple of times." I thought about that. You know that know. you've seen the song, right? Black and <laughs> Jewish. But... Yep, yep. Oh my gosh, I sing that all the time. I probably shouldn't. I need to know the song. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're, it's not, you know, if you're brave. And everyone watching, most of you should never Google it. But for those who have a sense of humor and can, I think it's kind of funny to watch. But I like it is pretty fun. harsh. Yeah, I like yeah. how it goes. You know, it's like you know. yeah, they got her. She's choosing in the song. She's choosing between uh, Hennessy and Manischewitz. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. That's funny. Uh, yeah. That's a, that's a ridiculous song, <laughs> and, and they're playing they're playing with dreidel and dice at the same time. Oh, so, man. so dumb! Um, so dumb. <laughs> Sounds like a treat. So dumb. Oh man, it's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. So okay. Um. All right, Shauna. So tell us some of your story. Yeah. Um. So I guess I'd start off with uh, I was in Masonic, I guess. Uh, community um, since I was 16. Um, my my mom and my my family on her side, they're all from uh, Trinidad and Tobago. And um, so we, we had same kind of similar um, childhood, I guess, uh, with Catholic first. We started off there. Um, and then there was a little bit of Baptist and a little bit of everything else in between. And um, and then we, uh, my mom was just kind of always on this like mission to figure out like what's the right thing, you know, in our whole family, um, you know, what, or what's the thing that made sense um, for us. And, um, and it wasn't until, you know, I turned 16, I moved to South Carolina and um, uh, we started getting really curious about Messianic um, Judaism. So um, there was a congregation there um, called Beth Shafar at the time. Um, and my mom is gonna hate it when I bring this up. 
But the first thing she did was she called, she found Lumbic in a newspaper and she was like, I wonder if they have black people there. And so she called and, uh, you know, she got the rabbi <laughs> on the phone. She's like, do black people go there? <laughs> Just straight up. And um, he was like, yeah, come on by. So we ended up going and um, <laughs> I've been a part of Messianic movement <laughs> since then. Ever since. Ever since then. Um, and I was, uh, I joined the worship team because I love music and singing and um, we've just always been a really musical household. We're always singing praises and worship. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I started off like piano and singing and, um, and as far as, uh, just kind of the welcoming that we got there, you know, it was, it felt normal. Like, you know, there were other black people, we were in South Carolina. I mean, <laughs> there are other black people there and, and white people and Indian people and other Trini people. We were so shocked. We were like, oh, you're from Trinidad. And, um, so it was a pretty good mix of um, really, really cool people. And I'd never really experienced anything um, uncomfortable um, or anything kind of like where we were, you know, where we stood out uh, like a sore thumb or anything like that. Um, I would say, you know, I, I started to really get more curious about um, my identity within everything as I got older. Um, just, you know, just being curious, um, like looking at the, my friends who, who kind of like what you were saying, Leo, like getting into the bigger group. Um, you know, I went to a conference one time, I think, um, and that was kind of an eye opener, um, just seeing like the majority, there weren't a, a lot of black people and, um, you know, and just that Jewish identity was so strong amongst a lot of people there. Um, so, you know, sometimes a question would pop up, well, how are you Jewish? Or how come you consider yourself Jewish? You know, or are you Jewish? And where do you, and, you know, a lot of it was just curiosity <laughs> because obviously I'm black. So, um, and so, you know, I just kind of had to do some digging from that point on and just figure out, well, you know, I think it's important to, I think Messianic um, Judaism is, um, a huge part of my life, even though I don't necessarily identify as a Jewish person. Um, I think, I don't think God uh, or Yeshua had that in mind either was, you know, to, so I can go into a whole thing about that, but, you know, it took a lot of figuring it out uh, for myself and why it was important to me to keep going um, in this movement. I'm married to a Korean man and we're both <laughs> in the Messianic Judaism and, um, you know, it's, it's, just a huge part of our lives and I think it's a uh, very factual and true um, compared to a lot of the things that I've sort of experienced growing up in different religions and you know all of that so kind of in yeah. a nutshell yeah. a Korean Korean guy Korean. and a Trinidadian girl and a, and a messianic <laughs> rabbi who married them yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the f well he I think part of the reason why I wanted, I think your three stories are different, right? So David's Jewish and, and black. Uh, Leah's uh, black and, you know, grew up in a Messianic congregation. I, actually, I mean, Shauna and Leah are probably more similar than different. You guys are probably going to be friends after this. because <laughs> You both identify, do you identify as African-Americans or Caribbean-Americans? Leah told me that you had, that's a good question. We, yeah. We talked about that because you're not African Americans. You're Korean. I mean, not Korean. That's Gene. <laughs> Shauna's husband is Korean. Uh, you're Caribbean Americans, which is a, Caribbean which is different, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I usually just say, I usually just tell people like, I'm a, I'm American. <laughs> I was born here, <laughs> right. but my but my family is from Haiti. That's usually what I say. Mm. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah. So. And being that Shauna and Leah, that you guys are not Jewish, I think mm -hmm. that's an important perspective in the Messianic world. And David's is important being black and Jewish. And, and part of my, there's really three things I kind of want the three of you to help me with and um, help others with who would watch and listen is, uh, I think we need help understanding history, um, particularly the history of, race in the u.s and why things are where they're at today mm -hmm. um i'd love to for you to help me understand your experience like your own experience um with race and the way it affects your life and 
um, I mean, I know as a Jewish person that people don't really, um, when something's not your experience, you just don't know. Mm -hmm. It's not because you're racist or missing something. You just, you just don't have to think about uh, things that don't come up. You know, I heard a black pastor say recently that kind of what I'm hearing a lot um, which I'm not sure I really understood before is he was talking about his son is 17 years old and just got his driver's license. And they, and he like wept that night because of the conversations he was going to have with his son about when you get pulled over, this is what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And I just, nobody had to have those conversations with me. And I don't think I'll have those conversations with my kids. So trying to connect like, why is that even a thing to what your own experience with those kind of, and then the last one is um, for me personally, what can I do differently based on having some empathy for understanding your stories and understanding history? Um, like how should my behavior, the way I speak, the way I interact with people, like how should I change? And then also kind of an overarching what does Messianic Judaism need to do differently um, in, in light of these things? So since Leah is a historian, let's, uh, <laughs> let's go through some history of, I think people know that there was about 400 years of slavery in the United States. I think lots of people know, although I didn't realize I didn't know that year six, 1619 was meaningful to anyone until recently. Um, but that's the first nine slaves came through Jamestown. Um, so I think a lot of people react to, as they do with all things in history, like that was a long time ago. Why is this such a big deal? Yeah, that's a really good point. I think, you know, for me, I think it's always, and kind of use a cliche term, like you can't know where you are until you know where you've been kind of a thing. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that's the whole point, right? That's why, that's why we learn history. That's why we care about history. Um, and it matters because the, the reason things are the way they are today is because of the way people either responded or systems that were set up a long time ago that were either continued um on in today into today or just just let you know not dismantled um if they were problematic so i think as far as you know obviously slavery is a big part of black history in america and i think even you know even if we're thinking about anybody anybody who is of african descent in the americas right so we're thinking not just the united states but also like North America, like Canada, or like South America, or the Caribbean, like all of those, all of us who are descendants of those folks are, are because somebody survived, right? So somebody survived a really tough system. And, and not just like a, oh, that system was hard, like a really like, incredibly demoralizing, dehumanizing system. And so, like, we are all products of people who made it, which is kind of a crazy thing to think of. But that, I think that's something that's important. And that's something that's a a shared history, even if you're not um, originally from the United States, or not original, but you know what I mean. Like, <laughs> if you can, if you can't trace it back to the United States, you can trace it to an island or another place, right? Um, that's that's an important part of the history, and and it's been here for a long time, and it's a shared experience. And then, you know, for thinking about wait, pause for a second, because I yeah. think then the difference is like my Jewish family and my Italian family on my mom's side chose to come here. Yes. Yeah, so and that, know, and that's a different story. It's not just immigration we're talking about. Yeah, it's uh, black people are here because they were forced to be here. Yeah, and I think that's right? a really, really important distinction. So, like at at the museum that I work at, and when we talk about these things, we're really specific about immigration, right? When we teach right. immigration, we don't we don't talk about slavery because that's not immigration exactly like like you said um right. and, and we teach slavery separately because um yeah and, and that and that is that is a an incredible difference and i think a lot of people 
choose to ignore that. Um, and then I think the other thing too, at least in the United States, right, we've got not just slavery, but then slavery ends in 1865 with the Civil War, right? And then you've got all of these black people who are free and people are like, what do we do now? <laughs> so, and so you've got this period of reconstruction and it's about 10 years or so where actually a lot of things, a lot of amazing things are happening. So you've got black people who are serving in the government, black people who are running their own businesses, black people who are um, making the system work for them in these 10 years. And essentially what happens in the 1870s, late 1870s, we have an economic downturn. And so the United States government is like, well, we don't really have the resources to maintain troops in the South, Union troops, to continue reconstruction. And so they pull their troops, they pull the Union out of the South. And so then, and then very shortly after that, you have the rise of the Klan, right? So the, the KKK comes out of this sort of like vacuum, right? The Union Army is no longer there. And so you've got basically domestic terrorism, and that's 100% what it is. Um, and you've got- Except they're still not, is it true that they're still not labeled a terrorist group? As far I've as heard that somewhere. I know, I, I think you are correct. I do not think they are, but I can look it up yeah. and make sure. Um, but- yeah. I mean, they came from my, my people too, but- <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's like- they, yeah. They come, they're coming for every, they're coming for anyone who doesn't agree with them, right? And so what's kind of interesting is um, when, we, when we're talking about systemic, right? Because that word has been floating around a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It goes back to certainly this time period even before, but like systemic means it's in, in everywhere, right? So it's in the government, it's in the economy, it's in society, like social structures and things like that. So for example, I don't know if you guys have either seen or heard of the movie Birth of a Nation. Um, yep. So the one that was from, I always forget the year, it was in like the 19 teens. And it was actually the first movie that was filmed or that was mm. showed at the White House in during when Win Woodrow Wilson was the president. Um, and that movie, my mom and I actually watched part of it on YouTube the other day, and I was like, wow, 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 this is real racist. Um, it was real, mm. real, real racist. And basically, it sets up this uh, structure that we see today of... Oh, um, it was originally called the Klansman. Mm. Yeah. Oh. It sets up this structure where Whoa. this white woman is basically being harassed by... A, a black man, but the black man is a, an actor, a white actor in blackface. Mm. So there's that. Um, and he's like chasing her. And then eventually she like jumps off a cliff and dies. And so then the whole, the men of the town are like, we've got to protect our women. Right. And so then, then they're the people who are protecting the town is the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and so it was filmed at the White House. It was shown at the White House. People were really into it, liked it a lot. The NAACP were like, hey, this movie's a bad idea. Please don't show this because you are causing violence to black communities. Um, mm -hmm. And they were like, nah, it's, this movie's good. We're going to keep showing it. And so <laughs> they did. Um, and so it, again, it sets up this, this structure, this idea that black men are going to harass and attack white women. And so therefore white men need to protect their women. Right. So that's some, that's that, that's one part of it. I mean, there's so many other things, right? We can talk about economy and whatever and housing and all that. But that's sure. one example. Um, and so then when we see like today or recently that video with Amy Cooper, right? And you're like, oh, oh, so this story has just continued, right? Where like a white woman knows that if she says says certain things people will believe her over this black man, right? So that's what systemic is, right? So it's it's like, it, it starts from a long time ago, usually from something we didn't ever learn in school that we all forgot, forgot, but it's yeah. ingrained in our society. So, I mean, there's so much more history. I mean, we don't have any time. Yeah, I mean, as on. as a Messianic rabbi, like my, my thing is, you know, the Jewishness of Jesus, right? That's like everything I do is around um telling a story that people seemingly used to know and somehow it didn't just get lost it got he he was de-judaized to the point where 
I mean, for goodness sake, uh, the guy from the Philadelphia Eagles posted the stuff last night. Deshaun Jackson posted some stuff about Farrakhan and a quote from Hitler about Jews. Uh, what? You know, That's it's bad. A, yeah, it's so <laughs> bad. And he had he apologized for it today. Uh, but this idea that there are people in this world who could believe in Jesus and hate Jews, mm -hmm. uh, one, because he is one. Like, mm -hmm. it, it's not even, a, you know, but there's like a rewriting of history that makes him, that de-Judaizes him mm -hmm. so that it can fit into. So, uh, you know, I know that's systematic <laughs> because it's across the board, but that sounds similar. I don't know as you talk about it, like as you talk, it almost sounds like, yeah, there was like a de-Judaism of Jesus, but it was yeah. kind of like there's a dehumanization of African-Americans through the slavery right. process. Through all, So right. that's what I think we were comparing it to, is like the dehumanization yeah. of, of Black people and African-Americans in the United States. There was, because there also was a de-Judaism de of Jesus as well, too. So I do kind of see that. I do. Yeah, I mean, the dilemma and, with 1619 is... Mm -hmm. There's never been a time in the U.S. where black people weren't, I mean, even before the United States becomes a thing, it's, it's already, the, the selling of people mm. is already well established mm -hmm. in the colonies right. before, um, you know, and the slave trade is, is you know, from, Europe into the Caribbean to the to North America, like all that's in full swing before the United States even becomes a nation. So, you know, part of the birth of our nation mm -hmm. is, I mean, I've been watching because it was just the 4th of July. Uh, I, I've been watching John Adams, which is a mm -hmm. thing that, you know, documentary or a docu-series that, uh, that Tom Hanks put together with Paul Giamatti. And it's, it's, it's like fascinating. Um, and there's even conversations where Ben Franklin, while they're writing the Declaration of Independence, well, Thomas Jefferson wrote it and presented it to Ben Franklin and uh, John Adams. And Ben Franklin says, there's, there was a part about slavery. And he said, you know, we should really push this. And they were like, well, yeah, because we all believe it's evil. Uh, but then Ben Franklin says, well, I guess we have to push for independence before emancipation. And that's just a mind boggling, like, people want to go back and be like, all these guys were racist and they all had slaves. It's true, because that's prevalent in the time. But they were, but they were also like, they, not all of them, but some of these guys knew it was awful and wrong but shifting it legally is like a whole nother mm -hmm. ball game um and just that whole like that's 1776 to 18 when's the emancipation proclamation 1863. Uh, is 1863 so you're talking about a hundred years from ben franklin saying you know i mean emancipation we should do that but I mean, let's do independence from England first. Mm -hmm. um, and then I read um, Fred Fred Frederick Douglass's for fit the, on the 5th of July, his speech about why the 4th of July is not for slaves. And that is an incredible speech. There's some videos going around that take pieces of it, but yeah. as, as Jesus people, the, I mean, his interaction in that speech with the gospel and slavery is just, mm. it's just, <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Um, so there's like a hundred years, a hundred years, another hundred years comes to us. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I think when we paint, we paint history in broad strokes, right? We're like, well, all of them were racist, right. sort of. Not trying to change the story. I mean, you can speak to it better than I can. Leah, but, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think we're. What do you guys think about the ter the stat the statue situation, the tearing down of all the statues? Like, 
there's all these different, like I saw, do you know, on July 5th, somebody tore down a statue in Rochester of Frederick Douglass. Yep. I was just about to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> like from the spot where he gave the speech. So like, yeah. you know, I don't even understand how is that, <laughs> how is that even connected? I mean, that's hard. I think, I, I mean, I don't agree with this just tearing down. Like, there are some that are like, hey, like, don't listen. To totally. We put up these statues. Listen, we know a lot of people have done bad things, right? Mm -hmm. Like, but we put up these statues for some, for the really good things that some of these people have really done as well, too. So we know there's, right. like, come on, even I know I've done some bad things that I shouldn't be recognized. I don't want anyone to know about, right? So, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, so, like, I can only imagine what these guys have done too so like but like i know they've done bad things they've done some great things they have done some great things for our country as well and i do listen i do believe in our country so i do believe in some of the history things that they've done but like i also don't think we need to glorify them as well too like right. so there is it's weird like there's a weird balance between maybe we need to have a discussion are these the right ones and which ones are the right ones to take down and why are we taking these down mm -hmm. not just let's take them all down because some of them mm -hmm. can have like yeah yeah I saw a uh, commentary, it, it was a video uh, opinion by Ken Burns, the documentarian. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he did an incredible documentary on the Civil War, mm -hmm. uh, which I watched right at the beginning of our quarantine. And along with his, That's I also watched his, I also watched the 15 hour documentary on baseball, which is <laughs> on the issue of race is pretty incredible. Sure, yeah. Like, Race and baseball are super tied together all the way back to the beginning of baseball. Um, but uh, he said in an interview that, you know, when you're talking about statues of people like, like uh, Robert E. Lee, Robert E. Lee didn't even want the statues. And his reason, and he quoted several from interviews that, Robert E. Lee was invited to speak at the installation of some of the statues. And his response every time was, I will not participate because the more we celebrate the Confederacy, the longer it's going to take for our country to heal. Hmm. Which is like, what? So then, then there's people who are like, Robert E. Lee was a good man. You shouldn't take down his statues. Uh, okay but he also hated that they were even there. Um, so, you know, I think we all just want things to be clean, right? Like mm -hmm. I just want it to be, can you just give me right and wrong? Like super easy. Let's just call right. statues right or statues wrong. Well, um, and it's just not that, it, it's, it's never not, that clean. It is weird. Like think about a place like Iraq, like they took down all the statues of Saddam Hussein when I went, like he wasn't there anymore. Like what? Well, right. <laughs> Like when there's bad leaders, like they take them down. Like we're the only country that keeps up these old bad like things. Where else do they do this? Like they take them down and we go their stuff. Like, you know, I don't Right. Although we have a statue in Seattle that I'm pretty sure is from the former Soviet Union. It's a giant statue of Lenin. <laughs> and, and it's in uh it's in I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Fremont. It's in Fremont. No. <laughs> um and I'm like, how come nobody wants to take that one down? Like, <laughs> that is not a good dude. Good question. No. But then they scribbled um, all over Jimi Hendrix statue, just saying. What? <laughs> Which, come on. Well, man. I think it's like, you know, I think, well, I'll say two things. I think to answer like your first question, I 100% think we should take down Confederate statues. To me, that's, that's not even a question. Like, yeah. Because my and thing Ken is, Burns was saying the same thing. Right. Because my thing is like, well, what are you trying to save? Like what, what, yeah. what, I, what false idea you're trying to right. hold on to? And I think the thing, you know, when- well, you, well, the simple thing is they lost. Well, right, they lost, but like <laughs> the thing is, so what happened, so we had a really great exhibition at the museum uh, two years ago that talked all about like black citizenship uh, during the Jim Crow era. And so they talked about those statues and when they were put up and they were put up like, like something like 30 years, 40, 50 years after the, the civil war was over. And so they were basically put up because people, again, like 
are trying to reclaim this history and and they know that they lost but they made this like lost cause narrative like oh right we we're never gonna win it's so sad feel bad for us and it's like no i don't feel bad but so so to me i'm like yeah we should pull them down i i think you know what what we're seeing and what we've been seeing with protesting and whatever is just this incredible like outcry and and you're gonna see some people do like wild stuff mm -hmm. but yeah. but i also think you know one of the things that i've try to maintain is like we've got to focus on what's the issue here right because at the end of the day the issue isn't even isn't so much statues or mm -hmm. you know uh all sorts of different things it's it's really like why is it that we cannot talk about race in this country mm -hmm. in a way that's useful and why is it that whenever and i think especially as people of faith whenever we bring it up in a faith community it's seen as divisive like, why are those the issues, right? And so at the end of the day, to me, it's like, well, because we've invited this sin into our camp. Like, you have so many people who call themselves believers, who own slaves, and who supported the whole institution of slavery, and then supported segregation after, and then support, you know? So it's like, we have this history and, and I think it's easier for people to talk about like, oh, this is bad what people are doing now. And I'm like, well, you know, when you actually learn about how horrible, horrible slavery was, like to me, it's like, I understand why people are like, burn it to the ground. I get it. Truly, I do. You right. know, it's mm -hmm. may, maybe I wouldn't necessarily, do, but I, I get it. And I think there's a lot in the believing world, especially of this like trying to police people's emotions and responses to really to trauma basically and that to me is so like that's like not it's just not helpful like i don't know I, and and those are the conversations that i've had a lot of of people just being like well this is ruining people's lives and property and i'm like yeah and it ruined people's lives and property for the last 400 years so i'm not sure what <laughs> you know right why don't they just stop looting right is a is a thing you see i mean i've seen messianic leaders in particular from the south say on facebook um but i think there's a hard reality to our, our the looting is a response to looting like mm. people were literally looted from their countries yeah. and forced to uh to be here yeah uh and treated as less than human um and now we're like why are they so angry yeah meanwhile just... so many black people like i said in the beginning like have survived it like really right you know and so you see like that and then you see people saying well they're fine or like they're doing well and you're like, like you're just like yeah you will smith and beyonce they're doing fine <laughs> right yeah so anyway. yeah just makes you want to throw up so <laughs> yeah or throw a punch <laughs> yeah 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 i mean i i think people are there's something natural about responding to anger with anger yeah um, but I do think there's a valid question in what, what are, what are people so angry about? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think when people are, uh, I mean, I think this is where Judaism, where Jewish people and black people connect on a level. Uh, I mean, David's, you're, you're like two oppressed people group in one um but i think they can come on it's like just like elizabeth warren and so or my which one was it elizabeth warren no oh. it was a senator from washington yeah warren <laughs> yeah, warren. yeah 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 i claim here um, <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I think like there's a great video about justice by the Bible Project. Um, and um, you know, their videos are, it's like six minutes, but it's just the idea of like the thread of justice through the Bible. And one of the things they say is when we were set free from Egypt, the commandments in the Torah are about when you go into the land, do not take other people as slaves because I set you free. So don't become oppressors. But there's an opportunity in oppression and in overcoming oppression for people to oppress because that's what they know. So the difficulty with people groups who didn't, who have not experienced oppression um, as part of their history is they're disconnected from the reality of oppressed people. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm always, I think I've always um, wanted to understand more about Negro spirituals and the connection. I just watched the uh, Harriet, the movie Harriet. Oh, I wanted to see that. Um, oh. I mean, you know, they called her Moses because she set people free. And there's like this, as a Messianic Jew, there's, there's a depth of understanding and love for the Old Testament in black churches that there is not, that is non-existent in the white churches. Very true. Because they can, black churches connect with slavery and freedom from oppression and white churches don't. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just an interesting, I mean, I, I'm like, you know, Harriet Tubman's last words, which they talk about in the movie, which is going to make me cry even saying it out loud, uh, is on her deathbed. She said, I go to prepare a place for you. Mm -hmm. Like it was a deeply spiritual, but the gospel was also used to oppress people. Well, they didn't preach the whole gospel. They only gave them the pieces that would keep them as slaves. Um, the museum of the bible they have the slave bible a copy of the slave bible which is everything about freedom taken out and that's what the slave preachers could preach to the slave like that kind of stuff is just mm -hmm. i don't know how people could like as someone who preaches the gospel and loves yeshua with all of my heart to use his name that way to use the scriptures that way uh uh, it's it's like un, unimaginable to me, but it's um, but the whole idea of there being a black church altogether is because they weren't allowed in the white church. So like, <laughs> it's just it's all very sorted. Yeah. So what's the combination, David? Of Ju uh, what is the combination of Jewish and black? Like, how does that play out for you? For, for you you came to kind of Jewish identity later yeah in life yeah so have you experienced uh, racism on both sides is there like a uh, I mean I don't feel like I experienced anything on my Jewish side because it's pretty easy to hide <laughs> like no one down the street really knows I'm Jewish right it's right like, right I don't get anything from that i mean i i except when you're, except when you're wearing a juice for jesus shirt <laughs> I, I mean i i i don't even know if i have any anymore <laughs> yeah, that's shifting uh, right. yeah race but i mean it's i i've had to actually start looking back on my life over the last little bit and trying to think back okay where actually have i experienced racism because i think i've grown up a little bit different than most african-americans I mean, I grew up in much more affluent areas. I grew up in Wheaton, Illinois. Like, it's 99% white, <laughs> right. you know. Um, now, looking back, I see, like, I didn't realize how much racism I experienced growing up. For, like, I, like, I look back and I remember experience of a band teacher telling me I should play trombone because my lips were big. Like, I didn't know at the time that was a very racist thing that this teacher said to me. But now I've started to look back and like, oh my goodness, my life is very like racist. Even a week ago, I got pulled over. I got pulled over for talking on a cell phone with my cell phone in my pocket. 
Like my cell phone was in my pocket, <laughs> but I got talk. I got pulled over for talking for talking to cell phone. So it's like, yeah, we definitely still experience racism. I experience even now in this time. So it's kind of it's kind of weird that we're still experiencing such heaviness. In the Messianic community, though, it's it's weird. In the do, Messianic community. do you do you find in the Messianic world? Uh, yeah, I mean, what's your experience in the Messianic community? So I just think my first experience in the Messianic community was in New York. Are you like suspect until they find out you're Jewish? Churches are. When I go speak in churches, they don't, that's the, I usually start off by saying, yeah. I don't want you guys to think, sit up here for the next 30 minutes wondering if I'm, if I'm Jewish. Like I tell them straight yeah. out, hey, I'm black and I'm Jewish. You don't have to think about right. it. Black and Jewish. Because <laughs> when, I first, when I first started speaking, I would get off stage in places like Kentucky and Iowa, like, you know, like, the first question would be like, are you Jewish? Like, are you Jewish? And you're like, what, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to start telling people like, right. I'm Jewish. But my first experience right. in the community was in New York City. And for me, right. it was great, you know? I had, because I was meeting people who were like, part of the Mexican community who were like Hispanic, who were what, from Australia, from, from around the world, like, everywhere and was very right. diverse my first interaction was like wow this is great i can fit in i'm black I'm right. Jewish. this works mm -hmm. but then it got a little bit harder when i stepped into the messianic like congregational world <laughs> it was a little bit different <laughs> uh because you want to maintain like a jewishness at some kind of like a heavy jewishness uh, other th other people and other things are pushed out, and I could and I enjoyed my Jewishness and I learned a lot, but I also did feel like a piece of me was being left out, and it was never going to actually be accepted fully into the community. And I learned to live with it and be a part of it, but I always kind of hoped like this other part could have been a part of it as well too. You know, so it's been kind of, and then here in San Francisco, there's just nothing. You know, there is no messianic community for me here. So it's like, mm -hmm. right. You know, I do what I do. Well, so try to explain that more. The, there's an emphasis. I heard you said this in the YMJ discussion too, which yeah. I was really in, intrigued by. Uh, there was emphasis on Jewish identity, but not on black identity. Yeah. And I'll, so this is one thing I really struggled with when I first started going to like congregation and really is I started to struggle with how observant am I as a, as a black Jewish person? Mm. <laughs> and I, because there was a point where I started being like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to observe for, for a good year, a couple of years, I, I observed pretty heavily, you know, but there was multiple times where I would go home to my parents' house. And there was like, this isn't how I was raised. And this is definitely not how my dad would connect in the least bit. And so it was weird for me to go home mm. and be like, oh, I'm not, I'm not eating this food that I've eaten for the last 20 years, but I'm doing it now because of this. You know, and it's strange. And it's a little weird because it's like, what if like, I don't know, a black Jewish person came to like a Passover dinner and said, I'm not eating the matzo ball soup because of my beliefs over here. We'd be like, what? You're not eating the matzo right. balls. Like, right? right. Like, it's like strange to us. Like, but right. yeah, so it's, I don't know. I needed, I need something to help figure out that other side. Cause I'm a, I'm not just Jewish. <laughs> right. Uh, there's more, like there's another side to me that I, that I need to connect with. I need to identify with mm -hmm. that actually, still needs to be there. I do believe I need the Jewish side, but I need the other side as well, too. Because I think it all goes into kind of knowing who I am, and knowing who I am kind of helps me in my faith and my relationship with Yeshua a little bit as well. So I do need to know this Black side and how it plays out and how I interact with the world with it, because that's how actually my faith actually revolves around that, too. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not just a Jewish yeah. believer. I'm a Black believer as well, too. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, similar question, and maybe it's just a kind of conversation. Uh, certainly, an opportunity for me to learn from the three of you is because uh, Sean and and Leah's 
so you're not Jewish, but in the Messianic world. So, I mean, I know I'm your rabbi, Shana, so this could get awkward, but uh, it, it really won't because Shana and I are friends, but. Uh, <laughs> it's going to get awkward. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. It's totally cool if it does too. I'm not, I'm not afraid. I, more than most people, I embrace awkwardness. Um, there's something like, there's something alive when awkwardness happens to me yeah. that I enjoy in a really mm -hmm. weird way. Uh, <laughs> but do you guys, do you ladies feel like um, being Gentiles in a, in a messianic world, uh, in kind of Jewish space and Jewish expression, is there a difference between being black and being a Gentile, or is it just, like, is there further separation in your own identity? Do you feel like leaders and people in the Messianic world have helped you figure out your identity, or were you left to figure it out on your own? Um, That's a good question. Mm. That's a good question. Yeah. I think, to put it, I guess, in short, however I can describe it, I think it was definitely just more of a personal journey. Um, you know, like I'd mentioned, I never really felt uh, secluded aside from just, you know, random conversations sometimes with other congregants, like, how are you Jewish? And, you know, that kind of thing. But um, I think, to be honest, like, so I lived in, you know, I went to that first congregation in South Carolina and that was great. Um, but I did have that occurrence of, you know, those people just kind of questioning, like, well, where do you sort of made me think about it? Like, where do you sort of fit in this whole thing, being a black person and observing Judaism? And um, there was an identity struggle for a little while there because, you know, a lot of what we were doing as a family was really trying to embrace everything um, from the very beginning. So, you know, we had to do everything Jewish. And um you know, and for me, I just kind of, okay, okay, this is what we have to do, but it didn't feel quite like me, you know, I didn't feel like uh, something that I absolutely had to do. Um, so it was weird. It was a weird just learning. And I think some of it, I'm still trying to figure it out as I go, but um, there's definitely more clarity over the years where I do understand the importance of um, the Jewishness of Messiah and how that does relate to everything that's Christian, which is the basis of my beliefs, my core is kind of where it all started. And, you know, I have my relationship, my walk with Yeshua. Um, and I've always just kind of considered that top of, you know, place in my mind and my heart, um, how I look at everything. Um, but as far as like trying to distinguish between being black and then being Jewish and in a Messianic uh, congregation, I haven't, I honestly just haven't felt that it's been talked about very much, um, aside from just those random questions, but there isn't like a, there, there hasn't been negativity, to put it that way. Um, hasn't been anything negative. It's just been sort of me figuring it out on my own. Um, and Matt, I really liked when I moved out here again, you know, I was trying to find a home, like a messianic home. And, um, and I, I, told my family this when I moved out here, I was like, you were the first person for me that really distinguished um, how, how do I say it? Um, you, you, you explained <laughs> um, that you didn't have to have this Jewish background and you didn't have to be a Jewish person to follow in the, you know, messianic Judaism and, and understand God in that way. Like you would say the joke, like God didn't accidentally make you be born in a Christian household for you to suddenly turn Jewish, you know, like he didn't, he doesn't make mistakes. Right. So, um, and you know, and I can't really describe it the way you have, but for me, those, like a lot of the sermons I first heard from you were just like eye openers to me. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Like we're not, we weren't, I, I mean, I, if I was supposed to be Jewish, I would have been Jewish, you know? Um, so, you know, that really helped me just kind of embrace who I am. Um, and then, you know, I could go on and on, like just my experiences um, outside of the Messianic community, being a black person living in Seattle, you know, um, versus living mm -hmm. in South Carolina, you know, and the way people just as a whole kind of approach me and talk to me. 
um, is different. You know, I haven't had any um, horribly racist incidences. You know, I'm, I'm like you, David, I, I had to think back, <laughs> like in light of all of this, and I'm like, have I been like, you know, really racially discriminated against? And, um, and there were, there, there were some instances, you know, that I could remember at the time, I didn't really know what it was. Um, I was younger, but, um, but now I'm just like, yeah, that was, that was, there was a lot of that happening. Um, and the funny thing for me, and Meta, I've expressed this to you before is, you know, I feel really passionate when I, when I consider racism, I don't use that word lightly. You know, I think about it, um, from all angles and, um, you know, my family's mixed. Like my stepdad is, is white. My step, my, my half brothers and sisters, I'm the oldest of six. Like we're super mixed family. And, um, and so I don't think we had the same kinds of racial interactions that, you know, African-American people have had. Um, and, you know, I came out here to Washington and I get a lot of like, oh my gosh, you lived, you lived in South Carolina. Was it racist? You know, <laughs> like, what was that like for you? And, right. you know, and I get where the question's coming from, but, you know, part of me just wants to be like, not in the way you think, you know, a lot of the experiences I had, and I, this might be a little controversial and people will be mad at me for saying this, but we're from other black people in mm. the South because of, you know, my family, like I can't, I have stories, you know, of just how uncomfortable it was at times. Um, but then I also, you know, then I moved to, uh, to Seattle again and, um, I sat in the bus once and a, a white woman didn't want to sit next to me. She covered her face and she scooched over to the side. And I was like, wow, I never experienced that in South Carolina, but here I am in, you know, Seattle. It's supposed to be so open. And, you know, this is the first time I'm experiencing um, what I felt like mm -hmm. was racism. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, just like putting things in a box and, and just kind of ha wanting to have blacks and whites. It's, that's not a thing either. I think it's really important to think of it as a whole, how people are being exposed, I think is the first step. Um, make, you know, relationships with people outside of your circle. Um, that will give you clarity into what's really happening. And um, that's super important, but I don't know what I was saying there, just going on and on. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. I, you know, I, I grew up in New York. So like, yeah, you know, when I moved to Seattle, which for people who aren't from Seattle, there are not a lot of black people in Seattle. Right. Uh, there, there are a lot of uh, Asian people, more Asian people in Seattle than I think I grew up with in New York. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, it's just a it's different closer. mix of people. So one of, one, of the, one of the first times I flew back to New York after we had lived here for a while, uh, I, I got off the plane in JFK and I, and I literally thought, there's a lot of black people here. And it wasn't like, a, you know, it was just, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I just, you know, I, I grew up around a lot of black people. And then I've, I've lived in a place where there's not a lot. And you just, you notice it. Go, I just noticed it going back. Like, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So you had a question, David. Go ahead. I was wondering, do either of you guys feel like, there's a difference between being a black Gentile and a white Gentile. Like, what do you guys feel is the bigger, like, if, is there one? I don't, I don't know. I, question. you know, I, I feel, I don't know. I'm asking you first. Let me think about my own answer. I don't even know. Like, I don't even know my own answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, Leah, Leah nodded emphatically. So go ahead, Leah. I think it's, you know what it is? I think it's this idea of this concept of passing. Right. Um, and I think, for white people who are in the in the messianic world, mm. they can pass. They they can they can make the choice to tell people if they're Jewish or not. Um, whereas black people, I think in the in the messianic world, whether you're Jewish or not, you still have to like prove that you are so or not. Right. <laughs> you know, and I think or you or are you Ethiopian? Yeah, I've gotten that a lot. Yeah. Uh, which right. is hilarious if you have seen it. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty distinct. Yeah. I mean, they you, just. You don't, you don't look like you're from Ethiopia you yeah. in any way. <laughs> <laughs> and I find, I found, like, so in that instance, you know, that was a crazy question somebody asked me. 
And I was just like, no, I'm not. But then I was thinking, I was like, well, why did they, why did they feel the need to ask me mm. that? And I think some of it, and then I, and then I told them no. And they're like, oh, well, maybe you, you should look in and maybe you see if you are. I was like, I know I'm not. Why are you? <laughs> and I, and, and it was just like a weird, and I, and I honestly, like they were, I'm sure asking, not even realizing, but I think what I noticed, at least with Ethiopia, with that sort of situation was to them, it was like, I was like, well, would it, would it be better? Would I be better? Would I be mm. better for you mm-hmm. if I were Ethiopian? Would it make you feel more comfortable, even if it's not true? Mm. And so I think, you know, my experience in the Messianic world, like I said, like in my congregation, it was very multicultural. So it wasn't that much of an issue in the congregation, but in the greater movement, I mean, I definitely had, like, I had this one, it was a wild experience, but um, I've definitely had a lot of people like be like, oh, your skin is too dark. Oh, your hair is like weird or whatever, like stuff like that. And then I've also had, then there was this other person who, um, like she, she was from the South and she just said some, some wild racist stuff. I mean, she said one time her and her friend were driving around somewhere in her neighborhood and they were like, pointing and laughing at all the black people on the street. And they're like, ha ha ha, look at, they're like monkeys. And I was like, oh no, what? So just like stuff like, and these are Why people, was she telling you that? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I was like, ah, I gotta yeah. go. I gotta get out of yeah. here. That's it was super cool. weird. And I felt obviously super uncomfortable. But I was, also, I was also a teenager. So I like didn't, you know, like I think yeah. that was a thing that was tough too. Like growing up in the movement, like you're, growing up physically just like becoming an adult and then also dealing with all of this and Mm -hmm. and it's like you know I know for me growing up as a child like my my mom was always super aware of she was like people like you're you might you're you're gonna have a tougher time because you were black and and just realizing that like she just made sure I knew that, but also then on the other side, made sure that I knew a lot about black history and, and black culture in America. And then, you know, Haiti as well, but like giving me that so that she was like, you're basically like your culture matters just as much as Mm -hmm. any other person's culture. And so I think that really helped with my identity. And so, cause you asked, you know, mm-hmm. where you sort of left to figure out your identity on your own. Mm-hmm. And I would say I, I certainly found it at home, um, not so much in the movement or in the congregate in our congregation, as far as being yeah. black. Um, and then as far as being not Jewish, you know, for a long time, I remember, I struggled with that, like Shauna was saying, just sort of like going through a personal journey of understanding how do I identify and how do I identify myself? Um, and at the end of the day, I felt, I was like, listen, like I'm called to this movement Mm -hmm. um, and I'm called to this way of life, Mm -hmm. but I, but I know I don't have to be Jewish and I know God didn't make a mistake. The same thing you were saying, Shauna, like, I know that. And so I didn't, it didn't internalize like, oh, I have to try to be Jewish. And I, and again, I think like in our congregation, like, I was also given a lot of responsibility fairly young Mm. and it was like obvious that people trusted me to do things Mm -hmm. in a messianic context. Um, But again, I would say in the greater movement, there's definitely been a lot of, I mean, and there is another, I mean, this was like a really rough comment, but it was, I remember we were at a retreat and again, I was probably a teenager, like maybe 20 or something like that. Um, and someone just said a really racist, racist joke about lynching. And I was like, I gotta go. This is not, you know, and so it's like, and so those have been my experiences in the movement. And then, you know, of course, then I, like, I went to like a public school and like whatever. And, you know, there's, there's experiences there too. Um, and, you know, someone once called me, I mean, I've just had, I've just had people like call me names and just things like that. Mostly referring to like my skin being really dark, my hair looking the way that it grows out of my head, Um, you know, and so, (laughs) so there's been a lot of that sort of tension. 
And so a lot of what I've felt called to do or what I feel like, yeah, what I guess what I felt called to do is just being that person that is speaking that speaks out about it and talks about and it and engages with the conversation Mm -hmm. rather than pulls away even if there are moments when it's really painful and really hurtful um and so you know I've seen a lot like Matt you were saying so many things I mean Facebook is like a dumpster fire but um (laughs) so many things that are super painful to read and and things that people Mm -hmm. post and you Mm -hmm. know people constantly shifting the conversation. Well, what about abortion? Well, what about whatever? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Those are important issues and not saying that they're not, but like, if if you can't even talk about this, then how do you expect, like, I think about like where it says like, you know, like in in the context of a marriage, but like if if a husband and wife are having issues, like God's not going to listen to your prayers. Like you got to deal with your situation and then he's going to hear you. And so I feel like, I mean, that's like a particular context, but I think even in the greater believing world, if you're not dealing with the issues with your neighbor, and these are issues that have been happening for hundreds of years, Mm. then I just don't see why we think God is going to like, be like, oh yeah, let's, let's move in this direction. Like, I don't know. That's just my interpretation. I could be wrong, but. I think on a, I, if I can comment on that, I think maybe the way I interpret, interpret that is a little bit of, you know, you can't move on to the next step until you resolve what you need to resolve because you're not prepared. Yeah. You're not prepared for the next part. You're still yeah. stuck in mm-hmm. this. You're not strong enough. You haven't graduated. So get over <laughs> it so you can move on to the next, you know, blessing that God has for you. So I think maybe that's a little bit of that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the struggle, uh, you know, for for a lot of people is, you know, back to where I started. Made me think about it again, Leo, when you were saying, you know, but slavery happened a long time ago, and none of you were slaves, and none of the people around were slave owners. Mm-hmm. So, um. You know, I think people have a difficulty. I mean, I think it's funny what you said, that people all of a sudden care about history. But history is very selective, right? What we we care about in history is super selective um, because they're things that resonate for us or it's a very one-sided telling and we use that. I mean, the dilemma with social media is nobody's on there to listen. Nope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right they're on there to stand on their platform and make everybody listen to them um so my frustration is whatever side people are on of any issue they pick a part you know i keep seeing people share like people who are anti-black lives matter the organization Mm -hmm. who then share those kind of sentiments like well i can't support them because but then also share and how come nobody cares about the black police officer that died and then it's like this wait what who said nobody cares about that person right (laughs) that's not you're totally missing the point of the whole thing um but we like pick out these like like i'm gonna prove that my stance is right i mean whether it's republican and democrat or black and white or whatever people choose Mm -hmm. you know it's it's super selective in in the way that we uh use information because we're just trying to make our own point which is right i have uh, i have frustrating yeah go ahead i have had just really recent conversations about that because when everything blew up these last few months um, and it, I mean, honestly, it started with coronavirus and people just yeah. getting on each other's necks over that and right. what their opinions are on, on that, you know, and just my, my way, I guess my approach, I'm not trying to say it's the, the best approach, but I can't function or respond. I don't respond to blanket statements. I don't respond to one-liners. Um, and that's right. what social media is 
filled with. And to me, it's so, um, it's, it's 10,000 steps backwards because when you do Mm -hmm. things like that, you, what's the purpose? I always ask like, what is your actual mission by doing that right now? Um, is it to create change? Is it to make this better? And if it isn't, you're just here to create chaos and you know, nobody has time for that. It's, that's not helping anybody. It's not helping our country. Um, so, you know, it takes me, it took me a while. You asked me Matt. you were like, am I doing the right thing? Am I saying the right things? You know, when all this stuff started happening and you know, or not, I wouldn't say you said it like that, but you were just like, you know, is there anything I could be doing more? Is there anything I could be doing um, to address this in your opinion? And, you know, I'm like, I'm asking myself the same question because I don't immediately respond back. Like it takes me a minute. I have to sit back and go, okay, what is happening right now? And this person's arguing about this, that person's arguing about that. And nobody's trying to take a minute to understand the other side of things. Right. And, and until you do that, there's no solution because all you're doing is saying, well, your feelings are not valid. You're, you know, the, the reason why you've come up with this rant, this one liner, um, maybe there's a little piece to it. Sure. That's true. But yeah, there's more to it than that. And you know, what, what do you want to do to help fix it? Um, and that's kind of my stance on that. So it takes me a while to respond. I'm just kind of like, okay, I don't need to get well, into this. I mean, even, even in the, term. even in the function of a debate, like an actual debate yeah, on an yeah. issue, part mm-hmm. of a debate is you have to be able to articulate the other person's position as if they, as if they were saying it. Right. Um, and what's happening, you know, I mean, I had this long, I, I had this back and forth with a guy that I went to college with, um, who's black. We didn't really know each other that well in college. It was a small school. I mean, we know each other. We're friends on Facebook. And he posted a thing about, um, you know, he's, he posted a lot of Black Lives Matter things. And one of the things he posted was blaming the Israeli police for teaching mm-hmm. American police the tactics like what happened to George Floyd. And there's so many holes in a statement like that because, one, the Minneapolis police were never trained by the Israeli police. Two, the Israeli police don't train people to put pe- their knees on people's necks. Three, there's a, an even older racist idea that it's the Jews' fault. Mm-hmm. And people don't like, and he called the Palestinians indigenous, and he's right, because they are, sort of, although they've only been called Palestinians since the 1920s. But... It's not a matter of anti-Israel or pro-Palestinian or pro-Palestinian or anti-Israel. It's, it's, there's real people on both sides. There's real oppression that happens. But you can't just say, you can't make statements like the Jews took the land from the indigenous people when Jews and Arabs are both indigenous people to the region. Like, it's sorted, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. But we try to throw on these like, Mm -hmm. and that's part of, you know, I think there's real concern with Black Lives Matter, the organization, mm-hmm. from my perspective, because they support uh, things other than Black Lives Mattering um, that um, that are, you know, that are things I wouldn't, um, like the d- dismantling of the, how, how they phrase it is the patriarchal nuclear family um and this like anti-israel pro pro pro-palestinian um kind of rhetoric that comes from some of its leadership and how to interact with lgbt and trans and all of these like you know other complicated issues that are equally as complicated as you know but attaching them to this just makes it more complicated, Mm -hmm. which the problem in Seattle with CHOP, which was five blocks from my house, isn't really Black Lives Matter for those of us who live in Capitol Hill in Seattle. The issue is all the complications of all the other viewpoints that took on Black Lives Matter so that when it was kind of publicized you know cnn was talking about the you know there's another hippie revolution happening 
and Fox News was saying we got to send tanks in and destroy it. Like, you know, there there's such polarizing like mm -hmm. narratives um, that aren't even really what's happening in the street anyway. Um, but in walking through, there's all kinds of murals painted all in that six block area. And, you know, some of them are pictures of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, you know, kind of that, that part. But then there's just as big Jerusalem is, is uh, the capital of Palestine next to a mural that says Jesus, next to a mural of Jimi Hendrix, next to a mural of like a slave ship, next to a mural of, you know what I mean? Like there's all these like wait, what is this act, what are we talking about here? Mm -hmm. um, that, um, but my, my frustration is I see people say, I've seen other Messianic leaders say uh, on social media, I can't supply, support Black Lives Matter, the organization, so nobody should use the term Black Lives Matter. And you're like, uh, but I don't think that's true either. Right. I mean, do they matter? <laughs> Of course, it's a hard. Of course, they do. This is a hard yeah. one. I struggle with this one, right? I don't. Yeah. Of course, I'm. I'm a Jewish believer. I do Jewish. Believer. I am not a Black Lives Matters the movement supporter in the organization. Sorry, the organization. I'm not yeah. like a supporter of Black Lives Matters, but I am a supporter of Black Lives Matters. Mm -hmm. You know, right. so it is. It is really different, and there is a big difference. It's like saying, like you know, let's let's bring it back to the Messianic Jewish world, right? It's like saying, uh, Matt, you, you're Jews for Jesus. <laughs> right. You, I am not. Shut your you, mouth. Right. <laughs> you, are Jews for Jesus. Like, you are a Jew for Jesus, but like you don't no, want to be Jews for Jesus. That like, belong to the organization, absolutely. Right, you know, but so it's right. like kind of similar the same. No, that's funny. It's totally the same. You're right. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, except Jews, Jews for Jesus isn't racist, but I. I right. Mean, I, yeah, yeah, you guys know yeah. what I'm trying to like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really it's a really good point but again like i think i think what you're saying is shoe matt like i think it's super complicated but i think more than that like i think we we can't get lost in the sauce and i think that's what that's what ends up happening is that you know people are people are frustrated right about the black lives matter organization and and some of the things that maybe they stand for or don't but i think two things i think the first thing is because I was looking at their organization's website to just find out about specifically the anti-Semitic stuff. Yeah. And it was very difficult to find. <laughs> so not, I was like... It's not on their website. That's interesting. I thought that that was interesting. That's the first right. thing. And totally. then the, sec the second thing is, so it's like, okay, so are we playing, are we playing a game of telephone here? Perhaps? Maybe? Mm. I don't know. So that's the first thing I was thinking about. And the second, the yeah. second thing is also like, they're a secular organization. So for us to Right. expect them yep. to be believing like, what we would consider to be whatever is that to me doesn't make sense but then the other thing is also <laughs> totally like, is that you know black lives matter the organization and the movement are a response to black lives not mattering and mm -hmm. then when you think about something like for example an older organization like the NAACP and you think about the backlash they've gotten for doing what they do, to me, it's like, well, it, it's, it almost feels like, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we say. At the end of the day, it feels like it doesn't matter if we're super right wing. It doesn't matter if we're in the middle. It doesn't matter if we're left wing, if we're LGBTQ. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, black lives just have not mattered in this country. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's sort of like we need to, we get sort of like tunnel vision on what's happening in our lifetime. But when you look back at what's been mm -hmm. happening and what Black people have been trying to do, yeah. it's like, well, you couldn't hear us when we were more moderate, mm. or, you didn't, or we you couldn't hear us when we were this. So, so when yeah. people get more aggressive, people are like, I don't know why you're so mad. <laughs> you're like, well, <laughs> because this is we're trying another no. approach. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way my brother that's the way my brother jake fought when we were kids i'm like hyperactive and super energetic and like i would like super annoy him and be like come on bro punch and then he'd be like no nah, i'm not really bothered by it and then my parents would walk by and he'd go matt you're so annoying 
you'd be like, wait, you just <laughs> like like there was a realization when people were listening, he knew exactly he knew he just knew what to do. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate that, Leah. I think that's yeah. and I think that's what happened with Chop is it became it frustrated the actual Black Lives Matter movement in Seattle yeah. because now it's not about that at all. Now it's about defund the police and now it's about the police need to be out of the city and now it's about all these other things um, that are connected but not really the issue. I mean, I, was, I watched um, one of my favorite movies is Lincoln. Uh, and in the speech, when they're trying to get in Congress, when they're trying to get the 13th Amendment passed, um, the Democrat who's arguing against it yells, you know, what's next? First, you want to end, end slavery. And what's next? The right to vote? Intermarriage? And you're just like, <laughs> why are any of those things wrong? Right. Like, like, why would that be, you know, but, but it's like this impassioned, like, then what? Mm. Uh, and, and it's just from, as gospel people, um, I mean, Frederick Douglass' speech it is amazing because what he talks about in the speech to a group of Christians, Christian women abolitionists, in Rochester on the day after the 4th of July, because they asked him to speak on the importance of the 4th of July. And he's like, it's not really important to us because uh, we're still slaves. Yeah. And um, the way he connects the complicity, complicit, complicitness, complicity? I think so. Uh, of the church speaking to Christians in prior to 1852, which is prior to the start of the Civil War. Like, uh, it's just a mind boggling, um, as a freed slave himself, to stand up and tell Christians that they were not being Christian mm -hmm. because he's also a Christian, but to not be, for not everyone to not be anti owning people is, you know, puts us squarely at odds with the gospel and the idea that we're all made in the image of God and the treatment of the mistreatment of any image of God is, is just something we have to wrestle with and actually own as uh, a people and our own complicity, which is partly why I'm asking, I guess, I mean, I was your rabbi, too, when you were going through those things as a teenager, Leah. So, um, I mean, to all three of you, what do you want, what do you wish, or what do you need Messianic Jewish leaders to say? That's a good question. What is the... Um, Yeah, I think, you know, I think for me, it's about engaging with the subject in a way that is respectful and in a way that understands nuance and in a way that also, like, I mean, in a way that recognizes that there is a problem that that their congregants, their leaders are facing all of the time. And, you know, there are, you know, I've had people be like, well, why didn't you just like say something? I'm like, cause you want me to just tell you everything? Like it's a lot, so like every mm -hmm. time it happens, you know, like, mm -hmm. and it's, it's sort of like, I think that it's easy for Messianic Jewish leaders to put themselves outside of the conversation because as Jewish people, they've experienced persecution. 
but I think what would be good, better is to recognize that they don't understand this sort of persecution um, in the United States, specifically with black people, and, and to recognize that, um, and es especially if you're an Ashkenazi Jewish person, that you can pass as, as white. And you have, again, it's like what I was saying before, you have the option to tell people or not. Mm -hmm. And right. so I think realizing that that has a certain, like you, you operate in a different sphere, <laughs> a different level than black people do because we can't wash off our skin, right? Like we can't pretend that it's not there. You know, we can't do those things unless you like pull a Michael Jackson and it looks crazy. But you know what I'm saying? Like we can't, we can't, can't do, do that. that. We're not going to do that, right? And yeah. we shouldn't. And we shouldn't feel. And I think the other thing is we shouldn't feel bad about talking about this. Like I don't. I I should. I shouldn't feel bad about that. And then also, you know, I think. I don't know. There just needs to be a little bit more ownership. Um, and I think also as believers, racism is not a liberal issue or a Democrat issue. Mm -hmm. It's not something that only people on the left talk about. It is something that we all, all of us experience the effects of racism. And Wait, so you're, you're saying that because that's, the, that's some of the rhetoric you're hearing. Yes. Right. Racism is a leftist issue. Right. Yeah. Or divisive. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so right. I think I think yeah. um, owning it as an issue and as a, as a thing that we all experience because even when you think with, with Jewish people, right, who are white, quote unquote, a lot of what unfortunately has happened with race in this country is that everyone is trying to move toward being more white right so that's why like and shauna you kind of probably alluded to this a little bit but like when you were talking about like black people coming at you right mm -hmm. there's issues of colorism in the black community right if you're too dark you're not as good like if if you're light like lighter than a paper bag maybe you've heard mm -hmm. that expression <laughs> before right like you like mm -hmm. there, so it's like there's this foundation of whiteness that has been placed in our society yep. even people who are oppressed mm -hmm. buy into and so i think it's important for us to recognize all of that instead of trying to say well i'm not the problem mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. like we all have biases we got to work through so. yep you said that right really but well. i i also asked my my friend javon who's a black pastor in seattle I asked him um, if black people can be racist and, and his response uh, was really eye opening to me mm -hmm. because the, the definition of racism is looking at another group of people as inferior. So his response was, well, based on that idea, it's really hard for black people to be racist because we're the ones that have been told and feel it's a different level for a black person to overcome inferiority but to come to the point of superiority is a whole nother jump um so there, there's certainly racism in all different forms and in all different groups mm -hmm. um but as it as an as an idea it's harder for black people to feel superior and act superior. I mean, it comes up in different groups. I, I think that's part of the difficulty with, with guys like Louis Farrakhan mm -hmm. is he's going on the other end of, mm -hmm. you know, we're just against everybody and nobody can tell us. So we're just gonna, yeah, you know, sure. fight against, that's like a whole nother. Right. Um, but as a general rule, it's, it's just not, it's not the same thing. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Leah. I mean, first thing I was going to say, I agree with Leah. Recognizing the problems is, is, is probably a big part of it. Uh, I know I got a problem. <laughs> like, like, no, like, I'm going to be honest. How many times, listen, I've been to MLR. 
right? And I've gone to MLR and I've seen black people who do Jewish ministry and I've looked at them in a different way than I've looked at other people. Like I, I, I do it. I, I, there's a Jewish, black person in Jewish ministry do the same thing to black people in our own field. <laughs> like I, like, you know, and right. I, and I'm like, well, what are you doing here? Like, this is a little weird. Like I do it. I do it. Like, yeah. you know, so I, but I, but I recognize that I do it, mm -hmm. you know? So I think there, so I, I, I can talk about it. So mm -hmm. I think the first thing is that we have to, we really do have to recognize that we actually, all of us, which is why I'm saying I do this. So everyone can actually accept you do it too. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Like right. you don't feel guilty about it. Let's just, let's accept that you do it. Now let's talk about it. And I think that's the next step is actually confronting it. So like now that we've recognized like, okay, we do this, let's confront it and let's talk about it. Um, I think in the, in the Messianic community, yeah, I think we, I think you brought something like, what did these, what did these, what did these ladies have to do to like have their own identity inside the Messianic community? One thing is like, did you have to form it yourself or were you taught it? And I think part of it is that they have to form it themselves. I, I, and I would say that we probably don't do the best job in the Messianic community of really emphasizing the importance of Gentiles inside the Messianic community mm -hmm. and, and emphasizing their role inside the Messianic community. Right. You know, because mm -hmm. as a yeah. Jewish evangelist, except when they give large donations, if Gentiles give <laughs> large donations, <laughs> oh, no. totally uh oh, are we gonna have, are we gonna be able to post it now? <laughs> We're doing so well. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I say, like, as a Jewish evangelist, like, yeah, I know more Jewish people come to faith through Gentile believers than they do through like. Jewish people so like mm, totally. I would love to see Gentiles in the congregations to share with Jewish people you know yeah. and like I especially I would love I and the more I think about it like yeah I actually would love African Americans to be more involved and black people more involved to share with Jewish people because I think mm -hmm. that would be even more impactful right to have like a yeah a Gentile black person sharing with a Jewish person Israeli over something that they know like I think that could have some huge impact on people so mm -hmm. You know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, I think we actually have to emphasize the Gentile role and not just the Gentile role, but it's also for colored people, Gentiles as well. That's that's a really good way to, to put it. I think it's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for historical context, at least for Messianic Judaism in the United States, because there's Messianic communities in other places. Um, but... I think for my dad's generation, which are all guys in their 60s and 70s now, you know, coming to faith in Jesus for them um, was, uh, was being ostracized on every side. Mm -hmm. So when you listen to, you know, like Jan Moskowitz's testimony and my dad's and all these leaders, it's like their Jewish families told them they weren't Jewish anymore, they were Christians. And their pastors and their Gentile friends who led them to the Lord told them, you don't have to be Jewish anymore because now you're Christians. And there was something in them that didn't feel complete in that and thought, you know, mm -hmm. if Jesus is Jewish and the disciples are Jewish, then like, why can't we be mm -hmm. Jewish? And maybe we should have synagogues and maybe we should meet on Saturday. Maybe we should have Torah scrolls. Maybe we should keep kosher. Maybe we should celebrate the holidays. Maybe we should celebrate Shabbat. We should circumcise our sons on the eighth day. You know, like they were like normal like these are all things the disciples never had to think through because it was just the way it was. So in flipping that over, I say that all because I think what happened was, and it, it's, it's a shift in our generations. Because what my parents taught me was a strong Jewish identity that's connected to Yeshua, not separate from. Mm -hmm. And that if somebody wants to embrace Jewishness, the way to embrace Jewishness is to turn to the Jewish Messiah. And so what I've understood um, is because my Jewish identity is so strong, I feel like I've come back around to what is the calling of the Jewish people? Like what were we chosen for? Everybody knows that Jewish people are chosen. I don't know if you guys, uh, Sean has heard me say this a thousand times, but you know, if, if you ask Jewish people, which I've done on a number of occasions, do you know what we're chosen for? They go, no, nah. <laughs> we're, we're just chosen. Yeah, for what, right, is the question. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And the answer is something like 35 times in the prophet Isaiah. It mm-hmm. says that we're, we're to be a light to the nations. Mm-hmm. That's our, there's nothing in the text. Uh, this is going to, this is where I'm going to make some people mad in our own circles. <laughs> there's nothing in the text that tells Jews to go to Jews. It, it's not there. All the way back to Abraham, I'm going to bless you so you could be a blessing to the nations. So there's like this natural shift of, okay, in my parents' generation, they had to define a modern Jewish identity in Jesus that has was erased or de-Judaized or, I mean, there's a thousand ways you can take it. So now in our generation, what we have to do is come back to the idea now that because there's a solid Jewish identity, I think it's a responsibility of our Messianic Jewish community mm-hmm. to now help Gentiles understand their identity as Gentiles, that it's not lesser that one's not more important than the other but that there is distinction i mean along with race and jew and gentile and all of these things i mean you go back you go to revelation chapter 7 and john sees a vision and he sees every tribe and he hears every language like it's it's not um it's a vision but it's a vision in which he sees distinction um, and there is distinction that is important theologically and practically um, in messianic communities, but also in the church. Like there has to be churches are coming to a point now where they're embracing, oh, we have Jewish believers that are part of our church that should be able to express themselves as Jews within our church. Like, you know, for me growing up, it was like, I mean, Jews who go to the church are well, they're part of Jews for Jesus, but they're, you know, <laughs> Jew, Jew, Jews who go to the church are like not Jews, but it, everybody's trying to wrestle with. So I say all that because I think, I feel like, and I'm not comparing myself to Peter or Paul, but in the text, Peter's an apostle to the, is called the apostle to the Jews who leads the first Gentile to the Lord in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. Paul is called the apostle to the Gentiles, but preaches in synagogues everywhere he goes and wrote Romans 1 16, for I am unashamed of the gospel for his power to save both to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And what's existed for me growing up is we would ask people, like you said, Leah, when people come in the door, plenty of Messianic communities say, are you Jewish? And if they say no, the answer is, oh, this isn't really the place for you. They might not say it that way, but that's how you. Um, and there's some messianic communities that are exist to be a space for Jewish people. Um, but I feel like Paul, in the sense that I feel like my calling and the calling of our community in Seattle is to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, to where we have a guy who I just talked about recently in his sermon, who came gentile guy accepted the lord you know prayed the prayer with him here in my office and you know i was talking about immersion in water and he said yeah i want to do that but i'm going to wear socks and i said why would you wear socks in the lake and he got like because i have a swastika on my ankle and i just looked at him and i said bro for all the things that you've been through in your life and all the things that you've carried for you to turn to Jesus in a messianic synagogue through a messianic rabbi, bro, I don't care what you have on your skin. It is a joy and a pleasure for me to put to death those things when I put you in the water and to bring you back to life when you come out of the water. And, and I just feel like, I mean, his name is Steve. We, I call him Swastika Steve because oh. I, think, I think there's more, there's more people. And my assistant rabbi is Turkish, Sorry. right? Ibars <laughs> is Turkish. And I say on a, on a on, because I'm, because Ibars is one of my closest friends in life, um, I, I really believe that there's going to be a day where we're going to see Muslims come to faith in really large numbers in the Messianic communities because it makes more sense here than it makes sense in churches. 
because there's connections that Islam has with Judaism that it doesn't share with, uh, you know, and, and yeah. I think there's, I think Arabs and all kinds of Muslims, like there's, there's things the church can't do that a Jewish understanding of Jesus can do that is going to open the doors to a much bigger audience than our Jewish people who are 16 million to the other, I'm terrible at math, but the other six and whatever billion uh, people that we were actually called to originally. So part of my function is to try to help people now because in light of all those things is to help Jews have a strong Jewish identity and Gentiles have a strong Gentile identity and let's go preach the gospel to all the other Jews and Gentiles. Um, so that was a soapbox. Sorry. I got passionate. <laughs> I, I started preaching somewhere in there. I was hoping, I mean, I agree. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, I don't disagree with you any either. And you know, I, yeah. I had somewhere else going, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, my half Torah portion for my bar mitzvah is Amos nine. And I, I always, when I was a kid, it was like, you know, Amos 9 is not, and God says, and I will rebuild the fallen tents of David. And that was like, yes, that's what I'm called to do. But the rest of it is, and I will rebuild the fallen tents of David, and I will call people from every nation who are called by my name to turn back to me. And then it was like, oh, wait, they're both there. Oh, they're always both there. <laughs> <laughs> Jew and Gentile is always there um, because it's actually the only division that got uh, first male and female, but there's really only two divisions that God created. He created male and female to operate as one image together. And then he created, took Jews out of the Gentiles in order to save the whole world through the Jewish people. So like they function, but all the other divisions, even black and white, and um, nationalistic, you know, American or Canadian or, you know, German or whatever, like all of those are man-made mm -hmm. things. And, and my frustration uh, is that people are far tied, m more tied to their political affiliation and their national identity than they are to being a child of God in the family of God, part of the kingdom of God that's supposed to open its doors to people from that. every nation. I that. You know, it's kind of interesting because like, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about a little even before, before um, we started recording was the Messianic movement <laughs> mm -hmm. as opposed to like the Messianic community. And so, like, yeah. when you're talking about, like, you're, like, the older, like, an older generation that started, like, and as a movement, like, I totally understand, like, they wanted to put this emphasis on Judaism and doing it, and it, because they were going to, like, it was going to Jewish people, and it was, like, yeah. Jewish, you're right, it's, but we said it's gone past the movement, it's, it's in a context of a community now, actually, and we're actually looking right. at the community, like, yes, we still need the Jewish identity, but now we actually, as a context of community, we actually need something more than just the Jewish identity because we have people that aren't Jewish inside of the movement because it's a community now. So now how do we yeah. facilitate the community, not just mm -hmm. the Jewish mm -hmm. movement, not just the Messianic Jewish movement, but how we actually facilitate the community, the Messianic community. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, need, you need healthy Jewish identity for Jewish people and you need healthy Gentile identity for Gentile people. Right, and it, right. In, until and until are, we... And who knows, like, if we actually start doing that, actually, we might actually turn back into like a movement. <laughs> like, like it, yeah. because we're moved, because it'll all be one group moved like together. Going one place, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, so what can we do differently from your perspectives as a movement? Well, let me ask this too. What should we be reading and watching? Um, I mean, I think a really good thing to read is letters, letter from a Birmingham jail, Martin Luther King. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Mostly because a lot of people quote Martin Luther King all out of context. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, so I think that, um, but I also think, you know, there's plenty, there's plenty out there, you know, that pe- lists that people have already curated mm-hmm. that are worth finding. And I think like that's something that I've seen a lot and I understand, you know, is like a lot of the time people will ask black people for resources and things, which are good, which is good, but also like black people have been writing things for hundreds of years. So mm-hmm. you could, you could find them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you could go find what it, what did, what did Du Bois write? You know, go back into the, go on the NAACP's website, go to the museum of the Nash, the, oh, I never remember the name, the African American Museum, of the Smithsonian, like there's mm-hmm. so much already mm-hmm. out there. And I think, you know, from my perspective, like it's obviously good to, you know, have conversations and stuff, but I also think it's, you can't only just rely on black people to give us, give everyone else the answers. Um, Although I will say White Fragility is another good book to read. (laughs) Um, Because it's, talking about why white, people, why white people can't talk about race. Um, hmm. and That's think, recent. Yeah, and I think especially in the believing world, we've got to get outside of the, like, I'll only read it if, it's, if a Christian person wrote it. Yeah. What do you think about um, James Baldwin? Um, yeah, definitely. Read, read his stuff. I think, read, I, I think, you know, in general, like, if you're going to be a well-rounded person you should read things by people who you already know you're gonna agree with and then people who you're like maybe i don't agree with some of their mm-hmm. things because then it what? Gives you that's some... too controversial we have <laughs> <laughs> you know because then you actually like that's what scholars do yeah. right like yeah totally so anyway i preach on that all yeah. the time like <laughs> yeah. i feel like you know that's true you have to get outside of your comfort zone sometimes and your your audience of like-minded people to really challenge your beliefs about certain things in my opinion i think that makes you stronger and it makes you more in the know um totally. it's just that and i do i do i wanted to comment on this earlier but um i think both of you guys said it leah and david um really really well i couldn't sum it up when matt asked that question it's just like well what should the basic congregation be doing you know um and just looking back on all of the crazy experiences i've had and just trying to figure out identity and everything um and my one of my biggest frustrations is the politics behind what messianic uh you know communities kind of drag in um and i don't um i don't love it it's just the you know i i feel like it's not about politics, sympathize, you know, show some sympathy for what you are probably not going through, or you absolutely are not going through, you know, Um, whether you're left or right or in the middle. Um, And this is why, you know, Facebook is the worst right now, because, you know, there are people that I love dearly. um, And, you know, and they'll just post random things and, and just not really be considerate, in my opinion, of the people in your own family that are struggling and going through this and trying to figure it out. So, yeah um that's huge that's a huge one for me it's just that the politics and you know again blanket statements and all of that stuff like take some time like make the effort to understand yeah yeah the effort i think you hit the nail on the head shauna like the effort is what would be would be so healing i Mm -hmm. think because i think the the thing and i was talking to somebody in our congregation who is black and you know I was telling her how, how I was frustrated or whatever and she was just saying like what I had to understand is that we especially as black people who are not Jewish mm-hmm. we have taken residence in your community so when people talk about anti-semitism or like holocaust or whatever I'm like yeah let's talk yeah. about it all in so so to me it, 
it's like I would really appreciate <laughs> if people would take the time. Like, so I'm good. I, like, I have a book by, I mean, I know Bonhoeffer is not Jewish, but like, I have a book by, about Bonhoeffer, or we have tons. I mean, you can see my bookshelf. Like, we have tons of books <laughs> by Jewish authors, right? And we, and we read them, and we, because we're part of this community. Mm-hmm. And, and even more than that, like, we have uh, books from all sorts of different authors from different perspectives. And I think what I wish that I would see in the Messianic world is that they, that people would realize that we as Gentiles are coming and people who are really like called in or are like in it for the long haul, mm-hmm. like we're here. So it would be nice if you could take a second and be mm-hmm. like, well, let, let me hear more about your community. Not what I th- already think I know about what it is to be black or what it is to be a woman or what it is to be, mm-hmm. a, you know, whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like, no, like, Actually, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to talk about women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's a whole other conversation. But we should have um, that conversation David's too. not laughing. You said yep. <laughs> I <was thinking laughs> that, but I did hear you. We should have that. I'm not, re- I'm not ready to talk about women either. You know, my. my, my <laughs> uh, but that's the thing. Like, I think, I think, I. Th- no, you're I right. Think we've got to like. Mm-hmm. People, leaders in the movement need to take stock of their congregations, right? And the people who they lead. And like, so if you've got a large Hispanic population or a large Asian population, learn about who they are, learn about Mm -hmm. their culture because their culture informs as much of their life as, you know, them being part of your community. Um, And so I think, you know, it just has to be deeper. It, It can't be, you know, I talked to one black person once and they told me this one thing. Like, it's got to be more yeah. than that. That's why I'm saying, though, I, I, and I understand the frustration of people asking what to read, but um, but there still has to be some guidance in things. Sure. You know, people ask me the same question. Uh, I got an email the other day from a random guy who was like, I took a Nazarite vow and I'd like to talk to you about it. And I was Ooh. like, <laughs> why would you do that like you know there's no temple in jerusalem right you know in order to get out of a nazarite vow you have to do sacrifices at the temple in jerusalem like you don't need to so people have like part of what we deal with all the time is people have perceived like pre, uh preconceived notions of what they're coming into like it was like, I've asked pastors and they think I'm crazy. So since you're a Messian- Messianic rabbi, could you help me with my Nazarite vow? And you're like, no, because I think you're crazy also. <laughs> <That's insane. laughs> like, this is not crazy town. We don't, it's not crazy town. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, so, again, but like people, the- legitimate people ask, like, I'm trying to understand the Jewishness of Jesus. So what do I read? Right. Yeah. And we've had to put together lists of things so mm-hmm. that we could say, We'll start here, but you're actually going to have to, re- if you really want to know, then you got to do the work to read it yourself and mm-hmm. interact with, the, you know, and because yeah. we're saying read it, it doesn't mean we agree with every word they say. <laughs> That's the interaction. Oh, wait, we of, might. No, I'm just kidding. Right? Oh my God. <laughs> Don't make me uncomfortable. Um, you know, but I think that's, <laughs> what if I you know, those, those are it. part of the, right. Right. I think that's true, though. There's probably some fear. Uh, so, so there still has to be starting points, you know. Yeah, well, I think, like I said, the Birmingham jail one is great. Um, Have you read the new Jim Crow? That's also great. Yeah. yeah. I haven't read Obviously it yet. Obviously, Just Mercy, on my because list. that's the one everyone's talking about. Oh, man. I love that guy. I've watched so many of Brian Stevenson's, uh, like, speeches yeah. in the last few weeks. I-, I can't even. That guy's unbelievable yeah. and i'm uh, this is gonna piss some people off too but <laughs> i would say growing growing up i was pro death penalty i i i don't think i don't think i can be anymore uh, mm-hmm. like i i just 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 from a few of those simple stories in that mm-hmm. like uh, i just you know it's supposed to make you uncomfortable learning things is supposed to make you uncomfortable <laughs> Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. You want um, to add something, David? Yeah, I mean, 
I'm not going to pretend that I'm an avid Black reader. Like, I know Black authors or Black books to read right now. I'm going to tell you, I don't. Like, I do, I do. Uh, But I will say, some of the New York Times articles that I have read have been, have even changed, like, my mind and, like, made me think of things really differently. Um, mm -hmm. And so some articles on ARC are really good. But I would agree with you guys, like, even if you're not reading and you're watching, like, please don't just watch one thing. Like, don't mm -hmm. fall down into the, 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 the rabbit trail of Google and YouTube where they only give you what you want to hear and what you want to see. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you want to go down a rabbit trail, you, you, you should follow Ice Cube on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, dude's been saying like, some crazy stuff re recently. Huh. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm an avid, you can ask my wife, I am an avid watcher of political news. Like, I like CNN, MSNBC, and Fox. I want to watch all three so I can form my own... <laughs> They all have good valid points. Like they all make points <laughs> that are really good. Yeah. So I want to form my own opinion. So like mm. read it, read the, all the points and form mm. your own opinion, like form your own kind of opinion. Yeah. I mean, back to Leah saying, if you want to be a well-rounded person, right. I mean, that's part of the problem. Yeah. I'm not sure I want to be a well-rounded person. Yeah. I am a well-rounded person, but that's a totally <laughs> different. <laughs> I'm well-rounded. Um, <laughs> Yeah, did you have other things you wanted to add to that, Leah? No, yeah. Oh, um, honestly, mo anything on PBS. Because I think, again, like, and this is just me coming from that academic world, like, yeah, you want to find things that are, that are done by people who it's, they have a vested interest in being correct. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they they've taken the time to be like historically accurate right yeah yeah and i think that because to me it's like you know you can argue all sorts of opinions but at the end of the day you know if it's not to at least from again this is really just from my perspective like if it's not historically accurate then i'm like i literally don't care what you have to say <laughs> yeah I mean, that's why I love, but you know, I mean, Ken Burns is the Mac Daddy of documentaries, yeah, but they are long uh, and sweeping. <laughs> right, but the beauty is, uh, the beauty is he doesn't tell stories to be right. He tells stories that reflect the time that he's telling the story of, yeah, yeah. and he tells multifaceted sides of like I these are the it. opinions that existed in this time period um and it's you know like his documentary baseball it's so long um i think it's like 15 hours but a big chunk of it is you know from jackie robinson on uh there's there's just um and that uh and the attitude in baseball before jackie robinson was brought in the whole development of the Negro leagues and why it was separate and what it was, you know, um, I've been watching, you know, my kids are teenagers. Well, two of them are teenagers. So I'm trying to run them through all kinds of, so we watched 42 about Jackie Robinson. We watched Selma, we watched Lincoln. We've watched, you know, we're just like, Those kind are of, all good. Yeah. Yeah. In, you know, and there's a scene in the Morty, in the movie 42, with the Philadelphia, uh, the Dodge, the the manager of the Phillies, who keeps using the N word mm -hmm. to get under Jackie Robinson's skin so that he'll freak out, and it is so it goes on for so long, and it is so uncomfortable to hear that mm -hmm. word used so many times because we just don't use it anymore. Mm -hmm. But unless you like actually put yourself in that time period and understand that they were really people that uh, and the whole idea that the reason why Branch Rickey chose Jackie Robinson specifically was because he believed that he could handle the pressure um, of all the yelling and all and not react um, like there were other black players who were better than Jackie Robinson 
Um, but they needed somebody who wouldn't react because they were people who were just trying to get a reaction so they could say, see, um, it's just like all that stuff is so. <laughs> and that like, that's so fascinating. Cra- that's so crazy because like, right. Like he's chosen because of that. And then pe- when people get frustrated about what's happening today, I'm like, do you not see how this is connected? <laughs> like, no, not- totally. The fact that that even had to be a conversation is right. a whole thing of by itself. Right. Like people are going to say awful, awful things to you, but you cannot get angry. Yeah. <laughs> it's is- like, ah, <laughs> you know, yeah. but for me as a dad, as a dad, like, uh, you know, I mean, Emma's 14 and she's getting all this information from all these different places, mostly from TikTok, but uh you know like and i i'm trying to bring her back to yeah but you know and in that whole scene she kept saying like this is awful mm-hmm. and i was like i know that's why we're watching it because you can't understand unless you put yourself in uncomfortable places mm-hmm. and understand what people actually experienced and are still experiencing yep um yeah. yeah so is there a specific way that we can change behavior or i think shauna you were just talking about i don't preach on politics at all because i hate them but i also grew up in a very republican world and live in a democrat world now in mm-hmm. seattle I mean, New York was too, but the circles we ran in were all Republican. Um, I think there's a shift generationally too, where the right wing Republicans of, you know, the Christian right in the 1980s made everybody feel like Christians had to be Republican. And now our generations are going back going, no, I'm not sure that's true. Um, And that's part of a generational tension. Mm -hmm. Um, But is there other things in terms of like, behavior or things we should be preaching about or teaching in messianic context that would be helpful for people to understand these things we're talking about it's a hard question i think (laughs) it's a hard Uh, you know because and this is why i think it's hard is because because like I'm sitting here thinking like, yeah, we could probably could, could we add other culture, other cultures into our, our community and doing these things, but then I'm, I'm also thinking like, well, like, it's a messy in a community. <laughs> like it already has a specific culture that it's already starting trying to develop and be a part of like, so to, to bring in other cultures kind of start to make it kind of an unauthentic culture. So I don't know if that would really work to start doing just talking about like black culture and a messianic congregate. Like, so I don't, I, I, so that's why I'm thinking like, it's actually really difficult. Like what, like, I mean, you know? yeah. One, one way to do it is, you know, I've been to Zimbabwe with Jewish voice mm-hmm. six times and to Ethiopia five times. And, uh, you know, I think there's no reason why we, they're writing, messianic jewish ethiopian music messianic jewish zimbabwe i mean they say lemba like we use jewish messianic lemba worship music that we could totally be singing in our communities Mm -hmm. as different jewish expressions than american judaism yep yeah which is like you know i think touch on that too and i get i get where you're coming from too david it's just like a, you know, it's a, it's a, still kind of a baby, you know, messianic congregation, messianic community, and yeah. we want to make sure that's strong. But I think it's also important to see the grander light of things, um, just in 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 the sense of, you know, all the nations. You know, the Jewish people were called to be a light to the nations, and um, if we can embrace other nations that are, because there are so many um, all over the world right now, India, China, everywhere. People are 
embracing Messianic Judaism. Um, and, you know, to kind of pay attention to that as well and, and make sure that that's in conversations, that that's being recognized, like, you know, with everything in Zimbabwe and stuff that's going on there. People are making music in their own language, you know, um, and there are other things too aside from music. So, you know, yeah, it's a lot, but I think it's important too to just kind of figure that out too in some way. Yeah, I agree. And I didn't give it, I think there's like a but, there's like another side. It's like, yeah. Well, you know. No, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's like, but what do you, how, you know, like, how do you do that? You know, that's, I know. maybe that's maybe the harder part. To and it. I know that your brother, I know that your brother just tried to do some like this stuff in, 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 in you know, in Chicago. I know like for like, a couple of years, like, they tried to do the choir the one time for the Passover, you know, and I, so I know that we, we try to do those. But let's be honest, even on that, like people start talking like, oh, like, was yeah. this weird? Was this not weird? We don't know. <laughs> Like so, it's like well, maybe. I mean, for his yeah, in his community, maybe, it's gone awesome. And maybe we should run off like these weird things to make it normal and to like make yeah. it because I'm a believer that like listen, the gospel transcends yeah. all cultures. Like if the gospel yeah. is in every single culture, so right. if it literally yeah. is in black culture, if it's in Jewish culture, mm -hmm. then there's got to be some way for us to figure out how to mm -hmm. find the culture that it overlaps. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, and what and what Jake did was not just sing black music. Right. 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 What he did was his worship leaders also black and through and and quite an accomplished musician. So in her relationships with students and other pat, you know, uh, churches and connected to choirs and like it's really based on relationship, not the use of the music. Right. It's mm -hmm. like these churches i think there's 12 churches that my brother in the last few years have gotten involved in celebration of rosh hashanah and then all of those churches having people join into this choir that practices music together for rosh hashanah like it's probably not gonna happen this year but because of the <laughs> virus but mm -hmm. you know but mm -hmm. it, it really is a suit it, it's just a really interesting um experiment in um I, th I have something about, remember the movie, what's that movie with Ben Stiller, uh, who's a rabbi? And oh, Keeping the Faith. Yeah. Keeping the Faith. Oh. <laughs> and he brings in the black choir into the synagogue. And all, like, there's some really funny stuff um, in that movie. But uh, yeah, I mean, we've done stuff, you know, Shauna and I have worked through some things. I mean, we've sing old hymns as part of our service. Mm -hmm. And initially people are like, you know, some people are like, <laughs> you can't sing hymns. We're like, why? Why not? I mean, I don't know if we'll sing the old rugged cross because that's just hard for me. To, uh, you know, but, <laughs> uh, but like how great thou art and it is well with my soul. Like they're just as much mm -hmm. a part of all of our stories mm -hmm. as the Amidah and the Shema and like, and it belongs to all of us. They're not mm -hmm. like, they don't have to be exclusively owned by groups because mm -hmm. they're, you know, they minister to people in different ways. Mm -hmm. Well, so. that brings up something interesting. Like, we have our own, like, we have these, we have liturgy. Like, it's been a part of our people for, like, a long time in the culture. Like, mm -hmm. and, well, I know we're talking about, like, Black people now, like, and, yeah, Negro spirituals, like, that kind of is, was their liturgy of those times. Like, yeah. So, like, the those things probably could have some place in Jewishness based off of it's not like written down or it's not anything. It's like, it's just like their liturgical prayer to God. Like, just mm -hmm. like we have liturgical prayer to God, you know? It's yeah. Kind of, yeah. It's interesting if you look at it in that perspective. Totally. <clears throat> I've actually dreamed about, I mean, this is originally my dad's idea, but I totally stole it and I'm actually going to do it <laughs> is, uh, is doing a, a Passover Seder for American slavery oh. where you incorporate the story of Passover with the, with the history of slavery in the United States really and you tie in Negro spirituals uh, into the Passover and do a celebration of freedom from the Israelites in Egypt to slavery in the United States uh oh, <laughs> oh my, phone, my phone just died too uh you take you know 
slavery from the Israelites, freedom for the Israelites in Egypt and freedom from slavery in America. And you marry the two, mm-hmm. like the liturgy of Passover with a liturgy of Negro spirituals and do like a totally different, I think it'd be super cool. That would be amazing. Uh, yeah, that would be maybe that'll be our next Zoom call. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I think also I'll, like you were, you know, because you were saying, what can we do to be better with this in the movement? Like, I think the other thing too is, and and David actually spoke on this when we were talking the Lime J one, is just being intentional about having multi ethnic leadership. Totally. Um, and so that I know that that's hard for a lot of people for a lot of reasons, but no, it's huge because I think like, you know, we could do all these things as like a nod to black culture or a nod to other people's culture. But if Mm. you don't actually have that person leading the charge, then it, then it just becomes like, you know, okay, are you just... Not, it's not an yeah. appropriation, that's not what it is, but you know, it's sort yeah. of just like people, it, it's the same, it's the same as like Christian people leading a Passover Seder and they don't know anything about it, you know? Totally, totally. It's a similar sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm glad you brought that back up. I agree. I think we do need to be a little attention. Yeah, about fireworks that. over here. Oh. Like, oh, that was loud. Sorry, go ahead, David. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. I think we should probably, yeah, I think we should be more intentional about kind of grabbing people of color, kind of put them in leadership. Again, if yeah. we didn't just put Jackie Robinson in baseball, we wouldn't have mm. ever had other black people come in baseball, mm. right? So like, if we never yeah. put anyone there, it's never, we're never gonna, we're never gonna really have anyone else mm-hmm. there yeah. to do it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm gonna, I mean, I'll be honest. Do I feel ever, as a Jew, as a black Jew in the Messianic community that like I, and it might not, it might be my own, it might be my own head. Do I ever feel that opportunities are not given to me because I'm black? And yeah, like I do feel that it might be my own head, but like I still do feel it, right? Mm -hmm. So like, how do we not make me feel that? Well, it'd be great if there were other people of color, at least somewhere Mm -hmm. in the ship around here, you know? (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, also women. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> okay, remember, we're not talking about women. <laughs> That's right. We'll come back to that. Let, we'll come back to that in another yeah. conversation. <laughs> yeah, well, I I appreciate you guys taking all the time to do this. Yeah. And um, I'm, uh, my hope is that we'll, that people will understand this as a, as a beginnings of conversations for our mm-hmm. movement certainly not a one-time deal it's something we can grow from and learn from um and i just i don't know you know david and i've met a couple times we don't know each other real well i've known leah since she was 10 and uh and i've known i've known shauna for a bunch of years now and um i just as a leader in the messianic community um i really value you and your voices i value your experience um and i want to do my best to learn from your experiences Mm -hmm. um empathize with your experiences uh believe (laughs) your experiences um and hopefully be a safe place uh for people to be able to express the anger and the frustration that they feel um, without feeling like um, they have to apologize for being angry. I think there's a lot to be angry about. And I think the anger is justified. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I just appreciate you guys. I think you just said what we wanted to hear. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. that's what that's what we want to hear. So th- so thank you for saying that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Cool. And having yeah, the hard conversations <laughs> like those are well. Tough. What Shauna what Shauna <laughs> mentioned before too is I I realized I was starting to have all these conversations like Lee and I actually 
had a long some long conversations and then I was talking to black pastors and and to other people and uh and it was probably three weeks into things that were happening in Seattle where I was just kind of praying and I just thought oh my gosh Sean is black <laughs> and like as a leader who has I mean, we, we don't pay Shauna a lot, but we pay her something to be our worship leader. And she's part-time on my staff. It really bothered me that I didn't ask her uh, how she was processing everything and what all this just meant to her. So I mm-hmm. called her and just said, I, I'm... I just need to apologize because I should have called you first. Um, and it's, it's not, um, it's just not, it's not good enough mm-hmm. to, uh, and as you know, I mean, it's funny, like, I mean, I can pass as white, but really none of our, well, our assistants white, but we have a Jewish rabbi, a Turkish rabbi, a, a Trinidadian worship leader and a white <laughs> ass- assistant. Uh, like, it's a pretty funny group. But just in my own context, it's like, we don't see, mm-hmm. um, we just miss some of the things we're supposed to see and we're supposed to be aware of and trying to become aware. Um, that's, I don't know, there's a lot of tears <laughs> in if I wasn't aware of that, how many other things have I not been aware of? And how do I become aware of the things that I don't know that I'm aware of, not aware of, you know? Um, so. I think we can all yeah. say that to some degree. I mean, it's just yeah. a learning process. And, you know, I, I never looked at it and said, well, gosh, man, I didn't even call me and say anything. Like, I really, I wasn't there totally. at all. <laughs> no, and you, and you received me super graciously, which, mm-hmm. um, which I appreciate. But there's still like, I mean, I think what Leah said before is impactful. Uh, is maybe sometimes we ask people like, well, what should I do? And, and the real answer is just, just learn for yourself. Like, just, we have more information available to us than anyone's ever had in the history of the world. So, and people are shooting outside of Leah's window, so. It's it's July 7th, come on. Um, Wow, wow, wow. wow, they're going for it. Wow. They have one of those, I don't know what they're called. It is 11.30 p.m. in New York. Yeah. 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 All right. Well. Thanks for, um, I, I will say thanks for having the conversation, for like at least doing it. You know, it is very important for the Messianic community to have this kind of conversation. I think not just for the Messianic community, but for the Jewish community, like, as yeah. well. Especially when we look at the Jew, like, it's going to be more diverse. It's going to be looking more like, this is what our community, like, so to start, I think it's great that you instigate, like, you started this conversation, we start having it. So, yeah, and thank you for letting us be a part of it, too. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, well, Leah made me do it, so. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Leah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Um, Thank you. And thanks, everybody who would watch. If you like it, you should share it and tell your friends to watch it and tell your rabbi to watch it, your pastor. uh, And if they have to get mad at somebody, you can tell them they can get mad at me. (laughs) <laughs> and, and hit me up at at rob matt and you can tell me how angry you are mm-hmm. um, about this conversation but um yeah well thanks guys have yeah. a fantastic yeah. evening it's nice talking to all of you Good talk. thank you bye bye